My name's Sasha. Uh, you can respond to anything I'm about to say on Twitter, at Sasha Rocks. Um, I study the way that humans communicate using the internet, and then I work with technology companies to help them communicate with those humans. So I'm gonna talk today about communication. I'm going to talk about the way humans use language, the way that's changing, and what that means. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we can best design the minds of the students whose lives exist as much on the internet as they do in the real world. Because educators are in the business of designing minds. I'm passionate about communication. Specifically, I'm passionate about the way that a human being acquires information, becomes empowered to apply that information, and then packages that information for communication to one or many other human beings with the implied goal of empowering those human beings to apply that information as well. In certain contexts, this is called education. We do it using language and words. Humans are exceptionally good at this process. In fact, I would assert that humans are better at communication than any known life form has ever been in the history of time. And we're getting better at it at an exponential rate. What human beings can do that nothing and no other species has ever been able to do is implant full thoughts from our own brains into the brains of other humans with exceptional precision. It's the stuff of science fiction, but human beings figured it out tens of thousands of years ago. And it's been incredibly disruptive technology ever since. It allowed a tiny species of relative weaklings to take near total control of an entire planet and beyond. And just think about how much better we've gotten at this mind meld trick in recent years. When you think about writing and numbers, the printing press, radio, television, literacy, the internet, and now the smartphone. Every human being now has the power to transfer a complete idea from her mind into the mind of anyone else anywhere on the planet instantly and for free. And we just figured that part out a few years ago. Humans are about to do some pretty incredible things. This is my son Ewan, and he is not about to do anything as incredible as fly this airplane. Uh, but when, when, when Ewan was about two years old, he had an uncanny ability to see birds. We'd all be in the car, and Ewan would say, bird, bird, and we'd all look around, and we couldn't find a bird. You know, all, all these adults in the car with graduate degrees could not find the bird. And at some point, we'd find it. We'd find a tiny bird at the top of a tree in the distance, and that's what Ewan had been talking about. And for the first couple of months of this whole bird thing, we were absolutely convinced that our two-year-old was a genius. And he may well still be. But then at some point, he saw a kayak on the top of a Subaru Outback, and he asked me why those people had a banana on top of their car. <laughs> and I became open again to the possibility that he may not be a prodigy. <laughs> I realized that I don't see birds because I don't filter for birds. Birds don't matter to me. I've learned not to see birds. Ewan saw birds because they were one of the few things he could filter for, because he had a word for it. He was at the very beginning of this phase of learning to sift through visual data and assign it to words. And this is, this is how we all start building the framework for our minds. We attach words to shapes. We build a very basic context for our world. Ewan was pretty good at this with bird. He wasn't so good at it with banana. But I said to him, Ewan, that's not a banana. We call that a kayak. A kayak is a kind of bird, or is a kind of boat. <laughs> <laughs> we don't attach bananas to the top of cars, and bananas aren't as big as cars. And he hasn't mistaken a kayak for a banana ever since. But I, but I didn't just say, this is a kayak, right? I gave him a little bit more information than that. Because just saying this is a kayak doesn't suffice for an advanced intelligence. It hadn't worked for banana. It's how we, it's how we all start the process, but it's not, it's not how the process builds. Um, there's lots of information I didn't give you in at that time. 
For instance, I didn't tell him how to spell kayak, which is something I might do today. Because he wouldn't have remembered that. He wouldn't have remembered that because he didn't know what letters were or that they could be combined to form words. Or even that the reason I would be telling him to how to spell kayak is simply that the ability to form words from letters is likely to be the single most powerful skill he will ever acquire in his entire life. It wouldn't have mattered him. He wouldn't have stored it and he wouldn't have applied it because he didn't have a context for it. So when he was two years old, I taught him how to spell his name, E-W-A-N. It took about 60 seconds to teach him how to spell it and he never forgot it. And it would be over a year before he learned how to spell anything else. But the spelling of his name meant something to him instantly. It had almost instinctive value to him. He was able to recognize the value in the spelling of his name. And we store information the best when we recognize its value. And we recognize its value when we have a context for it, when we have a framework for the why. So we're born with a lot of frameworks, right? We're born with a framework for language and for speech, for expressing emotion. Uh, but other than these basic frameworks that we have as babies, the rest of the information we acquire needs to be held firmly in the scaffolding that's been built in our brain if we want to be able to access it and apply it. And again, that's, that's what's at the heart of intelligence, at innovation, at this era of the deafening triumph of the human race. It's this ability not only to access and store information, but to apply it in ways we've never specifically been taught. Human intelligence is an emergent property. And that's what's at the core of education, too. When we teach, we are building that scaffolding. And our goal is for it to be broad and deep and unshakable. And then as it goes up, our student will turn it into an actual inhabitable building. And that building will be populated with data the same way that real world buildings are populated with humans. And that data will schedule too many meetings and they will get stuck in the elevator and they will have romances and breakups and just as you are about to stop watching, they will figure out how to walk through walls. And you won't know how they did it. You won't be able to reverse engineer it. It's an emergent property. So you want to make this edifice, the building of a student's mind, as intuitive as possible. This is not an intuitive building, right? The best designers in the world will tell you that great design gets design out of the way. When you are using a truly well-designed product, you don't think about the design, you just benefit from the function. The same thing is true of words. Great writing gets the words out of the way. When you're reading a great piece of writing, you don't think about the words, you just assimilate the information behind them. Because the words alone have little meaning. They have meaning when they're strung together just so. And when they're strung together just so, these properties emerge that cannot be explained by examining the parts. A great education does the same thing with the design of a mind. It builds a context for information that can get out of the way, that can be abstracted into something so much greater than the sum of its parts. Like this, you have all this data everywhere and it becomes available exactly when you want it, exactly when you need it, and you know where you've been from and where you're going. And in a world where data is free and instant, it's crucial that students have a strong context for the trillions of pieces of information they're going to be exposed to throughout their life. This is a cave painting from the Chave Caves. Uh, these are the oldest known cave paintings. They're from about 30,000 years ago. This is exceptionally beautiful, exceptionally well pres preserved, and it clearly took someone a very long time to make it. Um, and this brings me to Twitter and to text messaging and IM and all the ways that our grammar is being modified rapidly. And it's easy to look askew at this, but when we do this, we forget that language and grammar evolved exclusively to allow us to communicate information with precision. And generation after generation, our ancestors improved on language and grammar with that single goal in mind. And all of a sudden, it's taken this quantum leap, and our teenagers are figuring out how to convey these tremendous amounts of incredibly specific information in 140 characters or less. And that is wonderful. That is a victory. Uh, I call it a fluency in the language of data exchange. 
And, and my generation, the generation coming after me, the generation in classrooms right now has an incredible fluency in the language of data exchange. So the way this generation writes is not going to look like grammar <laughs> from 20 years ago. <laughs> because nothing about the way we communicate looks like it did 20 years ago or even 30,000 years ago. That doesn't mean it can't accomplish the same goal even better because the goal is not for it to take a lot of time. The goal is to communicate information with precision. And all of this, this rapid change in the way humans exchange information, these efficiencies in data exchange, these are the problems that technology companies face every day. And technology companies have developed a number of tools and methodologies to allow them to thrive in a world like this. And one in particular that I think has a lot of applications to the world of education is this concept of the minimum viable product. All right, I'm going to do a quick overview of the minimum viable product. It's pretty much exactly what it sounds like it is. Minimum viable product is the very simplest version of an idea, the core of an idea that can be released and hold value for the individual. In business, Zappos.com is a commonly used example of a minimum viable product. Um, right now, when you go to Zappos, you can get bags and handbags and view style blogs. You can get last minute prom essentials. But when Zappos first launched, the founder was literally going to the store, taking photos of shoes and posting them on the internet, and then running back to the store to buy the shoes if someone actually placed an order. He was validating a core idea. Will people buy shoes online? And once that had been established, then he went out and got financing and a CEO and built the billion dollar company we know today as Zappos. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the concept of a minimum viable product can be applied to the world of education. Um, I'm going to give a few examples, and you may be wondering why Christopher Columbus is on the screen. Or you may not have recognized that Christopher Columbus was on the screen. You may have recognized that this was Christopher Columbus if I gave you this piece of information. And I'm sharing this because Christopher Columbus is this perfect example of this piece of information we all learned that was in absolutely no way the minimum viable product. Um, here's some other things you know about Chris Columbus that are in no way the minimum viable product. The Christopher Columbus story is about power. It's about the way the quest for power drives and funds human behavior. Um, it's about uh, exploration and religion and political influence structures. It's about all these frame, frameworks that exist on a macro and micro level. You live the Christopher Columbus story every day in some way in your life, but somehow we all leave history class knowing that this dude had three ships in the late 15th century, and that is not valuable information. And not only is it not valuable information, but it cannot be extracted into a larger framework that can be applied to anything else that has any meaning in your life. Math is all about frameworks. And we represent these frameworks in a lot of ways for our students. And I think sometimes people get out of high school math without really understanding the core. What is a function? How do numbers relate? What is a linear relationship? What is an exponential relationship? Exponential functions are a really big deal. You know this when you look at your credit card bill or your mortgage statement. How does a high school student know it? This is one of my favorite visuals of all time. This is a graph of world population between 10,000 BC and today. This is an exponential function. We are living at a single point in history where this exponential function starts to get really, really interesting, where it starts to get really, really disruptive where a function that looked like it was linear for a long time but was actually exponential starts to have a staggering impact on our economy, on our ecosystem, on our government. And the students who are in classrooms today are the people who will be tasked with building a world that works on this side of this exponential function. And so it is crucial they understand how we got here. That they understand the way that numbers drive other numbers. So we're gonna talk about words. Um, the third example here is, uh, is about English. It's about Shakespeare, and when you're teaching Shakespeare, it's very easy to talk about characters and intersecting plot lines and quotes and 
lots of great stuff with Shakespeare, but to me, the core of Shakespeare is that we are still teaching Shakespeare in our classrooms. What is it this guy was doing that has such staying power? What does that say about humans? What does that say about our past, our present, and our future? Why do we write? Why do we read? How can you harness the power of words? So I thought a little bit about what my MVP was for today. What was my minimum viable product? What is the, the main thing that I want my audience to walk away with? And it's this. In a world where information moves into your brain on demand, like magic, simple erudition becomes a secondary goal. It is the best designed mind that will triumph, that will grow to control resources and to innovate and to shape the planet that your grandchildren's grandchildren will inhabit. So maybe, instead of saying, what will I teach today, we start saying, which feature will I design today? Which feature of a student's brain will I design today? And how will I add complexity and flexibility and speed to the design of that mind? Because educators are in the business of designing minds. So get out there and make something brilliant.